Hey guys, it's Matt, Stone Ape Farmer, coming at you from Farm For All. And uh, this isn't a video that I planned on doing, but the next video that I have in the works is going to take a couple of weeks to complete, just because uh, I have to wait for plants to do their thing. So uh, I thought I'd bring you along for a little harvest and a little project in the kitchen. Kitchen. <laughs> So what I have here are some uh, daikon radishes that are growing the seed and I kind of planted them as an experiment this spring just to see what kind of root development they would get before they bolted and they're all pretty tiny. Let's see if I can pull one up so you can see it. They're not huge for daikons but I wasn't expecting to get good root development this time of year I usually plant them as a fall and winter crop but I knew that even if they bolted super early I'd get lots of these little seed pods which are really great for eating fresh I like to put them in salads or stir fries and really one of the other reasons that I plant daikon is that they germinate so quickly so I like to put them in between crops as I'm waiting for them to sprout so I can tell where one thing ends and the other thing begins. So I've got my cabbages on this side and I've got my lettuces on this side and the daikon in the middle so that I can tell where one is versus the other. So I'm gonna go ahead and because these daikon are starting to shade out my cabbages especially in the morning gonna go ahead and harvest all these stalks now there's still lots of flowers on them I'm gonna upset this bumblebee that's buzzing around collecting nectar but I'm gonna harvest all of these I'm gonna take them into the kitchen and I'm going to whip up a little fermented pickle with them Now you'll notice that I didn't pull up the roots and the reason for that and one of the major reasons that I grow daikon radishes is to just let the roots rot in the ground. They'll end up because especially in clay soil they're able to get a lot deeper than most things can. They'll get in there deep and they will break up the soil and add organic matter deeper down than you can get just by mixing in compost or something like that and this way you're avoiding digging in your soil. I did pull up that one just to show you guys and uh, take that over and we'll uh, feed it to the chickens. They're sitting here waiting because they know that I always bring them treats from the garden. There you go. I don't think you really like the daikons that much but you'll eat the greens off of them at least. All right, welcome to my outdoor kitchen area slash greenhouse. We haven't finished putting the sides on the greenhouse yet, so right now it's just my outdoor kitchen. Uh, I'll talk, I think this is called a gorilla tub. I love this thing. I ended up picking it up on a clearance rack at a big box store. I think I had a specific use for it at the time, but I don't remember what that was. But it's, it's flexible. It's a good size for harvesting things. Uh, I like to use it for doing my initial wash of things like root crops. And uh, because it's flexible, you can kind of bend it and make a little spout. So uh, because we don't have running water, if I do need to get water to like a tree or something, I can fill this up and basically use it as a giant watering can. As long as you're not using it to water things that are really delicate and can't handle big volume of water being poured on them. So uh, what I'm gonna do is just 
pull all these guys out. And I'm just going to go through and pick all of these pods off. See, some of these are starting to get some little bumps. I don't know if you can actually see it from that far away. These guys are starting to get bumps. So they probably have pretty good seed development already. Let's see. I don't know if it's actually going to focus. See the seed in there? It's fine to eat at this stage, but uh, they do tend to get a little bit tougher once they reach this pit stage, so I'll probably pick out most of those ones. The ones that you're really going for. The ones that you're really going for are smoother like this. I'm going to go ahead and go through and Pick all of these off, throw them in my bucket so I can get a good rinse, and we'll go from there. Now, seeds of radishes, including daikons, are edible. So are the leaves, although I'd cook them. These actually aren't too bad. Some radishes have pretty uh, fuzzy leaves. Cooking helps with that. Mostly, like I already mentioned, I use them in the stir fries and I'll cut them up and put them in salads early in the season if I've got them going. But in this case, today I am going to ferment them. Now, I love to can, but since I haven't had a functional kitchen for a couple of years, I haven't been able to do a lot of canning. Last year, I ended up doing a ton of fermenting because that's what I was able to do with what I have for a kitchen. I've actually got it down to the point where I actually might prefer fermenting over canning a lot less hassle. Things won't store as long, but you can put away a lot of stuff really quickly with a lot less fuss. So I'm going to go ahead and go through, pick all of these pods off, and then I'll be back to show you the next step. Now, if you're asking yourself, hey, Matt, why aren't you saving any radish seeds? If they're forming seeds, why don't you just let them go and save seeds? This is why. I already did my daikon seed harvest a few days ago. This is from daikons that I planted in around December. They went through the winter and then formed seeds. These are from varieties, or rather from plants that I know can handle the cold and make it all the way through winter, and that's what I want to save seeds from since this is primarily a fall and winter radish. I don't know if you can see here, but these are getting pretty good and dry. There's still some uh, green material. The problem with some things, especially a lot of legumes and apparently daikon radishes, this is the first year that I've saved daikon radishes, they don't dry out evenly while they're in the ground. So even though these weren't as dry as I would have liked them to be when I harvested them. I was already starting to lose a lot of seeds to shattering, which is what happens when seed pods get really dry and start popping open so that they can disperse the seeds. I was already losing a lot of seeds to shattering, so I went ahead and harvested the whole crop, even though I would have preferred them to be, most things I prefer to be uniformly dry before I harvest them. In this case, I harvested everything. I stuck them in this garden cart. I've got a old sheet of plastic from a Home Depot, it was wrapped over something we had delivered. And I just used that inside the garden cart to hold all the seeds, anything that spills out. And I just clamped it onto the cart to make sure it doesn't go anywhere. And I'll let these dry out for a few days. And once they're good and ready, I will thresh and winnow them. And then I should have enough daikon rider seeds to last me for a while. So, I just stepped away to feed some aphids to the chickens. I noticed that uh, 
one of the pods had a, or one of the stems had a bunch of aphids at the top, and I've been collecting lots of seeds from daikon and turnip this season, and I've noticed that occasionally the tops of them, when they start going to seed, will attract aphids, which honestly is great. It doesn't affect anything that I'm really harvesting, and it seems to attract them away from my other crops. I have not had issues with aphids on anything other than stuff that's going to seed. And it's pretty effortless to just pick off the tops and go feed them to the chickens and get rid of them for good. So if you're looking for a trap crop, if you have a lot of issues with aphids, Try letting some daikon or some turnips or something like that go to seed and just leave them in the garden. The aphids will flock to that and then you can just pick the tops off and get rid of them. I've never processed this many at once, so I've never had to figure out how to get them off quickly. But I've discovered doing this large of a batch that if you uh, just kind of pinch the stem and pull down, they'll all come right off in your hand. And that makes it pretty quick and painless to get them off of there. So you can do a bunch really quickly. All right. I've uh, picked all of them off. And uh, like I said, you can eat the greens on these, but they're, they're pretty sparse. So I don't really find it worth the effort to pick a whole lot of them. Occasionally I'll throw a few in like a soup or a stir fry or something if it's early in the season and I don't have anything else. But... Honestly, the chickens love them, so that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go take these over to the chickens, and I'm going to bring out another container and show you what we do next. Hi, sweetie. Say hi to Peanut. D. Claude, still the best barn cat I've ever met. Brings mice into my room every morning to show me what a good job she did. Even though I would rather not wake up to dead animals on my floor. All right, here you go. All right, I'm uh, sure you've already heard me say it at this point, but we don't have running potable water yet. So uh, I like to do my initial rinse in our non-potable water just to get the most dirt and stuff off, especially with things like root crops, carrots, radishes, that sort of thing. Before I rinse them in our clean water, since we have to haul that in. So I'm going to go ahead and add some of the well water into this gorilla tub here, give them a quick rinse, and then I'll start sorting through, pick out the ones that have a uh, pretty big seeds starting to develop in them and are going to be a little bit tougher. I'll pick those out, leave those for the chickens, and put all the ones that I'm keeping in this uh, food grid bucket with some fresh water to give them a second rinse, and then I'll do one third rinse with French wa fresh water after I uh, get that done. That's what I love about these tubs. They've got the nice handles, good and big. So put a lot of produce in them, put some fresh rinse water in there, and give them a nice mix to get all the dirt off. Now I'll just start sorting through these stuff, which I'm sure you can't see from here, but stuff that. Uh, it's got the little bumps and it's starting to develop seeds. Toss those aside for the chickens. Back, got a bucket over here. The ones for the chickens will go in this bucket. The ones I'm keeping will go in this little food grid bucket. You can also kind of tell whether they're getting too tough to eat by uh, kind of squeezing them a little. So. I don't know if you'll actually be able to tell on camera, but this bumpy one is starting to get the seeds developed. If you try to squish it, it's tough. It won't even give any. The softer ones, they'll really, they're, they're pretty squishy. They'll pop open a little bit if you squeeze on them. So if you have any doubts about whether they're too developed to be worth eating, give them a little squish. You'll be able to tell. So I want to talk a little bit about the ones that I am discarding. I already mentioned that the 
ones that are kind of developing the bumps where they're developing seeds, toss those. Occasionally you'll find one that's actually still soft and I'll keep that one, but for the most part they're pretty tough. Sometimes you'll find one that's still pretty smooth, but uh, if you squeeze on it, it won't give it all. It's getting pretty tough. The other ones that I discard are any that have any kind of like bug damage or anything weird on them. And I also discard ones that are kind of small and uh, long, or ones that haven't fully developed yet. And they're perfectly edible, but they're fiddly, not really worth the effort it would take to clean them and deal with them. So I just discard those. Honestly, some things are just too small and fiddly to be worth dealing with. I can feed them to the chickens and turn them into eggs, and that's a better use for them than trying to feed them to myself. There's also uh, quite a few little uh, flowers and bits of stem that came off when I uh, pulled all the pods off the stems and discarding those as I go, little bits of stem. Now, you don't have to be as picky as I am when you're going through and picking through these. It's not going to hurt you to pickle some that are too tough to eat. just means that you're going to discover them when you go to eat them. Especially since it's not like I'm selling these or being someone else. They're for my own consumption. So if I end up with a few tough ones in there, I can just pick them out as I find them. But because of the quantity that I'm doing, I only want the best ones in there so that I don't have a bunch of tough ones filling up my container and taking up unnecessary space. These are uh, starting to fill up this container. I'm going to go add a little bit more water to this and start filling up a second container for the second rinse. Starting to get a lot pickier now that I see how many that I actually have that are worth keeping. Um, picking out a lot of the much smaller ones because it's not really worth the effort to check and see if they're too tough to eat. Rather just give them to the chickens, let the chickens decide whether they're worth eating or not. Like I said, nothing goes to waste. Anything that I don't eat gets converted into eggs, which would be much tastier than a bunch of tough, nasty radish pods. It's also speeding things up that I'm being more picky and I can just pick out ones that visually look like they're not going to be worth my time and not bother doing the squeeze test. That is everything that I'm going to keep. This is a six quart container. Looks like I got about a gallon total of uh, good pods and that was from a, a four foot row, single row of uh, daikon radishes. So. That was a pretty good harvest. I'm gonna go get my other batch of fresh water so I can give them one final rinse. Here's my other container of rinse water. Just gonna press these guys down. A lot of the uh, little bits of flour and stem and whatnot will float towards the top. And I can kind of pour part of this off. Might leave a few pods in the process, but I can get rid of a lot of the small floaty stuff that way. And put them in a fresh batch of water. Give them a good shake. And try to knock off the last little bits of flour and stem and whatnot. All this old rinse water right back in there. And now I'm going to go clean this container. This is actually what I'm going to end up fermenting in. All right. These are pretty well rinsed. I'm just going to move them back into this other container that I'm going to be fermenting in. Check for any little bits of flour and leaf that are still clinging to them as I Move them over. A little bit of stem there. I'm leaving the stems on. It would be way too much effort to take them off and 
basically I'm just going to treat them like you would like a pickled pepper or something. Eat the pod, discard the stem when you're done eating it. You're just hoping I'll give you some more attention, huh? Cats there rolling around trying to act cute. <laughs> We all know you're a murder cat. You can't fool us. It's not going to hurt anything if you do end up with a little bit of flour or stem in your ferment. Just might be something that you prefer not to eat and you'll have to pick up, pick off after you pickle them, but it's not going to ruin anything. That is all my pods. It's like right at the port port, one gallon line. Rest my rinse water. Uh, go into my grilla tub so I can take it over the chicken pan. We'll go ahead and uh, toss all these discarded pods in there as well. Chickens are going to end up loving those. And just set these aside. Go ahead and go get the rest of the ingredients and uh, show you how to finish this. Went ahead and got the rest of my ingredients. I don't have a whole lot to season them with. I'd love to put some peppers or something in here. Ginger would probably also be good, but my peppers aren't ready to pick yet. So I went ahead and got some chives. This is a combination of regular onion chives and garlic chives, and I'm just gonna. Uh, squeeze them, crush them up a little bit so that the flavor will release into the brine. And I'm just going to come in and shove them all down in the middle like that. Next thing that we need is salt. Now, for the few things that we do have to go into town to buy, we go to a restaurant supply store. That's where these uh, food grid buckets come from. And also where I get my salt. Because I do a lot of preserving, I just go ahead and buy my salt by... Uh, this is a 25 pound bag and that way it lasts me a while. I don't have to constantly go out and buy teeny tiny little containers of salt. It's not amazing salt. It's not like a salt that I would use to like finish something with, cook with. But for preserving, all you need is just a good old granulated plain non-iodized salt and that's what this is. Now, usually I would like to do my ferments by weight. I would uh, go ahead and add all of my ingredients, add enough water to fill up my container just above the level of my veggies, and then I would stick it on a scale and figure out how much it weighs minus the weight of the container. So if you put your container on the scale and tear it, or if you put your container on the scale and figure out what the weight is, and then subtract that from the total weight, Figure out what the weight of your water and your veggies and all your seasonings is. And then you want to do two to three percent salt by weight for the weight of your veggies and your water. So what I would normally do, I would put this on the scale with the water and everything in it. Figure out what the weight is. I would hold all the veggies in and pour the water off into a different container. Measure out two to three percent salt solution, mix that into my water, and then pour the water back over my veggies. In this case, since my scale had a little accident with the toaster oven a few months ago, I haven't been able to replace it. I'm gonna go ahead and do this by volume, which is not my preferred way to do it. But what you want is around two tablespoons per quart. I have four quarts here. The water is going to be a little bit above this, so I'm going to do probably uh, probably about 10 tablespoons for this entire container. And this is a, a two tablespoon scoop sold as the coffee scoop, which also came from the restaurant supply store. And I'm just going to measure out 
10 tablespoons of salt into my radish pods. Just kind of sprinkle it around. It doesn't really matter. You're going to add water to it and it's going to get mixed in just fine. All right. Ran out of storage space. Funny how that happens when you're shooting a bunch of HD video. What I've, uh, I'm not sure how much I lost, but what I went ahead and did is uh, add some fresh water on top of my uh, salt and radishes here. Uh, filled it up to about the four quart mark, just, just enough to cover the radishes. And now comes the secret part and the reason why I have really started to love fermenting over canning. And that's, you're not limited on container size. If you want to get like a 50 gallon food grade barrel and mix up 50 gallons of sauerkraut all at once, you could do it. I don't know why you would need 50 gallons of sauerkraut unless you're feeding like a few hundred people, maybe a few thousand people with that much sauerkraut. But the nice thing is I have these uh, six quart food grade containers. I can fill one of these up rather than doing you know, four or five little quarts of ferments. Now, I do love using air locks with my ferments. Typically, if I'm doing a smaller batch, I'll use like quart mason jars. And traditionally, I would uh, get a lid that has a uh, air lock on top. And that just helps seal the container so that you're not getting kind of mold spores and yeast and stuff blowing in on top. It won't really hurt it, at least most things won't. A lot of ferments will get like a, a yeast, a film of yeast on the top that you can just scoop out. It doesn't hurt anything, but I'd rather get, prevent anything weird from growing on top of my ferments to begin with, and air locks help with that. Well, the, these containers do come with lids. If you really wanted to, you could drill out a hole, put in a gasket, and install an air lock. I've done that before. You can pick them up at like a, a homebrew uh, supply shop for like brewing beer and stuff and just use them for your ferments. But I discovered a method that's way more ingenious and makes fermenting way less of a hassle. And that is to use a plastic bag. Now, typically if I'm using like a quart mason jar, I'll get like the quart freezer zip top bags, the thicker plastic, and I'll use that. And in this case, because I'm using these larger containers, I can't get a zip top bag that's big enough to fill this. So this time around, I'm experimenting with these. These are uh, just the Reynolds slow cooker liners. And since they're food grade, that'll be perfect for using in our ferments. I mean, I would prefer to use non-plastic things. I'd rather use glass and stuff, but plastic is what I have that's big enough. That's what I'm using in this instance. And basically what you want to do is get your bag opened up, fit it down inside here, just drape it over the top like this. And now, We've got this up to about the five quart mark. We'll call it four. What you want is to add more brine in the top of the bag here. I got my little scoop. I'm gonna call it two quarts, what I'm adding on top of this. So I'm just gonna add a couple more scoops right here in the bag, a couple more scoops of salt, four tablespoons for this size of a container. And then I'm just going to add more water right in the top of that. Near the top, it doesn't need to be all the way in the top. And basically what you've done is you've basically added a weight on top just like you would normally use. A lot of people use like glass weights or something to hold their ferments down because you do want all your vegetables to be below the level of the water. So adding a bag with water on top acts as your weight. It also, because the weight of the water pushes the bag against the sides of the container, 
It also creates a seal that acts like an airlock. Now, your ferment is going to off-gas. It's going to create CO2 as the bacteria break it down. And as the pressure builds, it'll be fine because the air will be able to escape up the sides of the bag here and get out of the container. But because there's a water seal around the edge, it'll keep other contaminants from getting in. All I do from this point is I throw a lid loosely on top. You don't want to seal it because you do want the gases to escape as it's fermenting. And then I'm just going to stick this somewhere cool back on a shelf to sit for a few days. Now, it is getting into summer. Typically, you do a lot of your fermenting in the fall as you're going into cooler weather so that it'll be able to sit out without getting too strong. And when you're fermenting in cooler weather, it'll take a few more days for it to go. Because it's pretty warm, this will probably only take a few days. I'm going to start checking it at like two or three days and see how they're coming along. But basically, you can let it ferment for as long as you want, as long as you still find it, find that it tastes good. This particular one, I'm going to start checking it around day two or three to see how I like them. And then I'll start eating them as soon as they're at the point where I like the flavor. I'm going to stick this in the coolest place we have. We've got a dark corner, no windows, it stays pretty cool back there. And then I'll just leave it there. Typically with a ferment like this, if you got it to the point where you like the flavor and you want to halt the fermentation, then you would stick it in the fridge. We don't have the fridge space for that right now, so I'm just going to stick it in the coldest place we've got. And that'll keep the ferment nice and slow so that I've got time to work through these. I will uh, check back in a couple of days and we'll report on how the flavor is. Hey, a couple things that I forgot to mention while I was uh, filming that. Uh, first is that if you do fill your container too full and it gets going pretty good, uh, the ferment can actually cause your container to overflow. Uh, best practice is to stick your container on a plate or on a cookie sheet or on a towel or something to catch any liquid if it does overflow. The other thing that I didn't mention is that the reason we're putting brine in the bag is just in case the bag gets punctured or something, you want the liquid in the bag to be the same percentage of brine as the liquid in your ferment, just in case the two mix, it gets punctured somehow, so that you aren't diluting your fermentation. Hey guys, it's been four days. The ferment is well underway at this point, and I wanted to go ahead and uh, show you how it's turning out. All right. I'm not sure if you can actually see this on the camera, but it is bubbling away. You can see some of these uh, larger bubbles here, but there's some uh, active fermentation happening in here. And uh, this is what they look like so far. You can see the brine's getting nice and cloudy. It's a sign that everything's working the way it should be. Let's go ahead and give them a taste test. All right, here we go. And cheers. Mm-hmm. I'm starting to get that great fermented flavor. I like my ferments to be pretty sour. The longer you let them go, the sour they're going to get. Of course, with uh, a fermentation, it's a lactic acid, not an acetic acid like you're going to get with the vinegar pickles. So it's not going to be quite the same kind of sour, but they will get more sour the longer that they sit. In this case, I only put the chives in it for seasoning and I'm wanting a little bit more flavor. So the great thing about ferments is you can go ahead and add something in after your initial setup. And I don't have anything fresh coming out of the garden right now as far as seasoning, but I do have some dill seeds and I'm going to go ahead and add some of those in. All right, here are the dill seeds that I have from the store. I just uh, pulled the plastic back a little bit. I'm gonna add a bunch of these guys in. I mean, this is a pretty big batch, so I'm gonna add quite a bit. That should be good. I don't know, 
mix it in a little bit with the fork here, although they won't mix in super well until they absorb some water. But that should be good enough. And I'll just make sure they all end up in the water. Cover back over with the plastic. And uh, few days that flavor should be uh, incorporating into the flavor of the pickles but overall they're pretty good I'm looking forward to how they turn out with uh, the seasoning but as far as I'm concerned this batch is done you can uh, go ahead and if you're doing smaller batches you can store them in the fridge or if you have enough fridge space and you're doing a big batch like this you can store it in the fridge uh, they'll continue to get more sour the longer that they sit out at room temperature and uh, if they're getting to the point where it's the maximum amount of sourness that you like, you can stick them in the fridge and that'll slow the fermentation down so that it doesn't get sour super quickly. And yeah, the great thing about ferments is that if you don't like the flavor of them, you can go back through and add seasonings after the fact, just like I did. And really, you're not limited on what you ferment. Pretty much anything you're pulling out of your garden or even things that you're picking up at the grocery store can be fermented just like this. I love this great uh, plastic bag system where you just fill the top with brine and it creates a nice little airlock. It's a lot simpler than using like the airlocks to fit onto a mason jar or something like that, even though you can use this system with a mason jar. So you aren't limited on container, you're not limited on airlocks, you're not limited on vegetables. Just everything about this is great. All right, that's it for this video, guys. If you liked it, be sure to hit the thumbs up and subscribe. Uh, let me know down in the comments what your favorite things to ferment are and uh, if you've got any interesting methods like the one I showed in this video that you like to use for fermentation. One other thing, uh, my friend Emma over at the Permaculture Pantry just lost a loved one. She doesn't know that I'm doing this, but I'd love if uh, we could uh, band together and go show her some, some support. I'll leave a link to her channel down in the description. Go watch some of her videos, give her th some thumbs up and some comments. Um, I'm sure she'd really appreciate seeing that uh, she's got a community here that supports her. That's it for this video. So, to a thousand subscribers and beyond, thank you.